welcome to Conversations on Social Issues. We're so happy that you're able to join us today. If you aren't familiar with the COSI series, we hold this in the library every Thursday because you see an extension of our charge for freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So we're hoping that we're able to learn from the folks who are here today, learn from each other, and engage in conversation to widen our perspectives, right? So I'm currently planning the spring quarter schedule, and there are a couple spaces left. So if you're interested in leading a session and you are passionate about a topic, come talk to me and we can try to see if that would be something we can get on the schedule. Uh, outside, and we'll be bringing in a number of resources for you to look at if you're interested in learning more about this topic and any other topics. So, next week we'll be having a panel on unions and millennials, the new labor movement, and we'll have representatives from a number of global and state uh, unions. But today, I want you to welcome our panelists for re entering education for formerly incarcerated, formerly and currently incarcerated students. We have Sam Armijo, Marvin Chapman, Kira North, Ralph Buck, Derek Boyd, mm -hmm. and of course at the end we also have Nick Rankin, who's our reentry, our prison education reentry navigator. So please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Um, so, my name is Nick Rankin. Thank you guys for being here. Um, guys and gals, thank you. See, um, so yeah, I'm the reentry navigator here. I'm one of nine navigators across the state. Um, and it's working to kind of create like a smooth transition for folks that are entering back into society, right back home, that, that want to take a path of education. I'm trying to break down some barriers and walls, so that's possible. Um, as you'll hear in a little bit, it's, it's hard enough to start your education path. I'm just a regular college student, but if you come here, you have just a multitude of barriers that are unavoidable, so it, it just adds another layer on being a college student. So I really wanted to get uh, these people together here to kind of share those barriers, what's working, what's not working, um, and just offer um, support for the students and kind of educate the community on like, what's needed for us and what, what's out there and what's not out there. So really want to focus on them so they can go ahead and talk and then I'll get back into some stuff later. Um, thank you, Nick. My name is Kira Nork. Um, I just recently, well, two years ago, I got out of prison. I did five years, four months, 29 days of all in all. Before that, all I did was sell drugs and do drugs. While I was incarcerated, I got a degree, taught math and graphic design while I was in there, and realized that education was my path out of the life I had been living into a life that of being the person I could be. Um, four days after release, I came to Seattle Central. I just graduated in the summer with my programming degree. I'm currently almost done with my first year of my bachelor's, of the third year of my bachelor's up at North for application development. And I think to give this whole talk a little bit of, a little bit more perspective, and I said this in a meeting once, and I think it still holds true that the only difference between any of us sitting up here at this table and the vast majority of all of you is that we got caught. I mean, it's as simple as that. And based on a 10 second slice of our life, where we made a series of bad decisions, or even just one bad decision, we have obstacles placed in our path, and barriers, and a stigma attached to our name, and who we are for the rest of our lives unless we're proactive in helping to remove or reduce that the public's opinion of who we are. Um, and one of the best ways I've found to do it, I've worked with almost 75 students now mm -hmm. getting them into helping them get into school after incarceration, is to help them make the change themselves and become, become proactive in their own education, their own new careers, and their own new pathway in life. <clears throat> my name is Marvin Chapman. I've been, this is my second quarter here. I was recently released like three weeks ago, February 6th. Uh, I was, you might have seen me around for a little bit on the work lease. I just finished doing 10 years in prison. And the biggest barriers I think I faced was trying to re-navigate life and to deal with the fast-paced movement. When I was incarcerated, 
I don't even remember seeing half as many homeless people, maybe a quarter or a tenth. I never even, I thought it was illegal for people to go to sleep on the side of the highway, so that was a big surprise with smartphones. I just seen one for the first time a few months ago. So when people are telling me to text and tweet or tweet for whatever it is, <laughs> I would look at them with confusion, trying to understand what's going on, and really just having to adjust to working in the classrooms where previously all my classrooms was book and pen, and now all the teachers are saying, get online and do this or do that. I'm like, I don't even know my Google password. I don't know how to log in anything. So all the education, I mean, all the technical barriers was a big challenge, and also it's, it's kind of hard to be in a class with a bunch of people and be like, yo, I can't call you to get the homework assignment or tell your teacher I can't call you to get the homework assignment because uh, I'm technically still locked up and I don't have a cell phone. So I just think that the people not being aware that everyone doesn't have this free access to be able to do the things that you really take for granted. And being recently released three weeks ago, and this is my friend I've known for years, and he's not in the same situation. I see him going through the struggle where literally he only has the classrooms and one room where he's authorized to be in. And if he goes outside that area, even though he's on an education ground trying to get his education, the police can come and lock him up. For if he went down to, if he would have caught the street to Panera Bread, and they seen him, they'd be like, "Yeah, you're not supposed to be here. Let me take you to prison." Mm -hmm. Even though he's in a situation where he's trying to better himself. And I just recently got the situation, and that barrier right there, along with trying to reconnect with friends and family, obviously, when you're well, when you're released, you have a lot of people that say they care about you and miss you. You may not see too much of them over the years. And I mean, it's rough to deal with, but now with so many people vying for my attention and want to be able to say, oh my goodness, I missed you so much, or let's go hang out, let's go meet up with the family. I'm, I've been able to get over it, but personally, I've had a little issue like, you really love me, huh? That's crazy, because I ain't seen you for 10 years. I've only been an hour away. I've been in the state. So how much do you really love me? Or is it just a matter of I'm the new fad or new trend in your life right now? <laughs> and four months from now, after I lose all my Twitter popularity, you're like, oh, I'm going to unfollow you or something. <laughs> That's what it kind of feels like at times. But just being able to reconnect and deal with the fast-paced life has been a major barrier for myself. Here. <laughs> I'm Derek Boyd. I, uh, I did seven years in the Washington system for uh, first degree on robbery. I came from a decent family, uh, but in my teenage years, I got off track. I kind of ended up in a different environment, uh, in a different state. My parents sent me to live with my biological father. and. Uh, my life got off track. I got introduced to a lot of negative elements and uh, was trying to understand my identity during those transformative years and uh, things kind of got confusing. So um, <clears throat> life after that, I mean after your adolescence, was, remained pretty confusing trying to reconcile um, one life with another. Eventually uh, ended up associating with the wrong people, wrong place, the wrong time, gave the wrong person a ride, and he was involved in the wrong things, wasn't really paying enough attention, he robbed and murdered someone, and I got charged as an accessory. Actually, in Washington, you're charged as a principal, so. Um, I was charged with first degree felony murder. I pled guilty to rob one with a firearm in order to avoid um, the potential life sentence. I spent seven years in Monroe, uh, but from day one, I tried to look at my incarceration as an opportunity, a time to reflect on my own life, a time to improve myself. I tried to take a selfish look at it and say, this is my time. This is my time to work on me. So uh, although the prison system really, I wouldn't say that it's designed this way. It could be like a college campus. Um, 
It's certainly not designed that way. It could be like a college campus if you have the wherewithal and the ambition to use it that way. Um, you're, you're surrounded by a wealth of human potential that's wasted um, in a lot of ways. And, uh, but if you search out the resources, there are some resources there. Uh, a lot provided by uh, private NGOs that support academic education programs like University Beyond Bars um, and FEPS over at the Women's Prison. Um, and there is state funding for vocational and technical programs. I got really involved in education because I believe in the transformative power of education. Um, I personally experienced the transformational power of education. Get a little choked up about that. But it's true. It's true. It's valuable, especially when you consider that human potential to be raised. Um, but I think that the vocational technical education that's being provided by the states in the in the state prison system uh, needs to be buttressed by that academic education that the private NGOs are providing, because that's where the true transformative power of education can take place, and that's why I'm involved. <clears throat> what was the question about? Just talk about what you said. Rob, uh, Rob Buck, I've been going to school here for uh, about coming up on a year. Uh, I'm in the engineering program. Uh, I've been out of prison for about 18 months. And my story is uh, for the past 30 years, I've probably done 12 years in and out. I've uh, been in there five times. So, when I first came here, and uh, Kira was doing the reentry thing, he kept trying to reel me in and stuff like that. And this is kind of—I'm just talking. This is kind of a misconception that I had. Is that I thought that when I got involved with reentry and stuff like that, it was going to be a bunch of stories about what was going on in prison and all this politics and stuff like that. And, and I'm, that's how I thought it was, but it's not like that at all. Which is really like, like a really huge thing. And people, we can sit here and talk about all these barriers and stuff like that, and, and say it's this reason and that reason and stuff like that. But when I kind of look at the situation, it's like, we're doing now exactly what people have been doing all along their whole lives. So to come and for me to have this belief that society owes me something special is just kind of false. It's, um, but there is some barriers that people don't really talk about sometimes, and that's like the barriers that we have in our heads. One of the things I struggled with was, uh, this sense of entitlement that you know that society owes me, and I struggled with that for for a little while. I kind of had to put that off to the side. I had to make a decision: What am I going to do? Am I going to uh, am I going to keep in that lifestyle, or am I going to uh, do something with my life? I'm going to yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I forgot my train of thought. Sorry. Um, but yeah, the barriers, uh, when I think about it, it's just, uh, we can talk about the housing, we can talk about the paperwork that you got to do to get into school, we can talk about um, living situations, rent, all that stuff. But really what it comes down to is what's going on in our head. You know, when I think about reentry, I wanted someplace where I could go and just talk to people that's been locked up, that understand where I'm coming from. To understand, like, when stuff gets a little overwhelming, I just want to bail, you know? And uh, I've come a couple times, and I guess there's just not a lot of funding, but I've come a couple times like, I just need to talk to somebody. If I'm going to make this happen, I just need to talk to somebody. I don't need a bunch of money. I don't need a, a, a pat on the back or anything. Just somebody sometimes just say, hey, you can still do this, you know? And, uh, and it's just like, I can sit in, and, and we're coming uh, for myself into a place that I don't, really feel like I belong, uh, doing something that I never thought I could do, it's kind of, it's pretty scary, you know? And to show up every day, in spite of everything around, looking like you're not going to make it, and just keep trying. And uh, I think that people coming out of prison, if we can like meet that need right there, uh, that, that people's success, you know, can be a lot more, you know? Because sometimes, like these, Housing and stuff like that, those are little speed bumps, you know? But those little speed bumps will stop us if that gets inside our head about, you know, well, I can't make it, so I might as well just quit. You know, and it's about people moving forward, you know, I guess. Uh, yeah.
probably I won't say that anymore. Hi, everyone. I know the bigger back here. So my name's Sam. I'm with Grand Tree. I think most I've been here on the campus for over a year and a half now. Um, kind of consider myself the Grand Tree mascot. I'm trying to recruit. I want you guys to know that we're asking for your help in any way, but mostly support. Uh, handouts, like you said, we, you know, I really like what he said. This is true. We, we, we come in every day going, this is really going to be possible because of all the barriers that we do face that are just part of life coming from that kind of life to this kind of life for so many folks that just get up and do the right thing every day. It's normal. Well, <laughs> not so much. So, but anyway, I want to be able to, or I want to know everyone to be able to hear me. Um, uh, what was I going to share? I just jumped on. Um, uh, I, I do believe that like there was, you see that there's different walks of life, different backgrounds. Doug said he had a great family. Um, I have no family. Uh, you know, there's some that had, to, you know, this or that. But like uh, prison, if you want to go, I mean, anybody can go. All of them go. You know what I can see? He's cheating and put his arm down. That walk, that walk is so much different. When you step out and someone looks at you and says, you can do this, you know, I never thought I could go to college. Or I should keep kind of the great part average. I, I just never, uh, my past is just you know, like anyone else's. It's got a lot of hurt and pain and what have you. But that's not what uh, I'm up here for you today. Today, I think what we're just going to just share a little bit about ourselves and it's going to open up. And you guys are open, like I said, mascot thing, recruit. Anything you guys would like to know, I'm open to answer any questions. And I think the work is too. So that's all I'll say for now. Because an hour goes fast. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about like the program, what like we're doing now, and what's been going on um, prior. A lot of the students here have been working on. So um, I'm up at Student Support Programs. We have a great support up there. Um, Info Central has been doing a lot of work, and there's been a lot of work on this campus. Been going on for uh, quite a while. Um, we're trying to uh, we're trying to open some more opportunities. We have a couple work study positions that are reentry focused. We're looking for more. So if anybody has any positions, work study positions, I think let me know. Um, we're also trying to. Um, <laughs> Figure out some ways for internships for students that are um, coming to school here that it's a really barrier that they can't go into a lot of organizations or companies to complete those. So we're trying to think outside the box and trying to uh, get some organizations. I want to go. Uh, <laughs> that'll accept uh, some students and kind of like bring out those skills and let them have that opportunity. Um, it, as far as uh, what we'd like to see, obviously, is a lot more opportunity. Um, the funding, we, we have students that come out, they, they don't have nothing. And a lot of people don't have nothing. Poverty is real. It doesn't matter if you're reentry or not. I mean, that's a barrier that's there. We don't have the funding that's needed for like, our students. And, you know, they get real creative. And there's ways that it happens and makes it work. There's been some kind of grassroots stuff that's gone on. And uh, we obviously, we would like some more funding to be able to help these students. They come in with not having a book. They can't told they have access to a laptop, well they don't have access to a laptop and obviously in our in our space it's very welcoming. You can come up there all day, any day that we're there and use the laptops, and use the space, use the printer, um, have the camaraderie with the fellow students there. You don't have to be reentry, but everybody's been very supportive in that office and on campus that I've seen. You know, we could do better as a community, like anywhere we can, but I think we're just scratching the surface on what we can do as a community for uh, this population. And uh, I'm, I'm going to keep trying to do what I can and try to get the whole village on board. That's what it's going to take. If anybody has any ideas, you can come up to the office at any time and talk to us. And, um, yeah, we're just going to keep pushing. So. If you guys have questions too, or you know, everybody wants to bring up other stuff. Yeah, I got a question. Yeah, sure. On, on your path to um, dealing with all the negative and stuff from coming out of jail scene. What parts of the recovery you have to get into to stay away from the negative? I, mean, I think that's an individual thing. It's it's kind of you're going to have each individual is going to have different different path and different barriers, and you got to find what works for you and try to latch on to. A, I, I think having positive like support, having positive. I mean, not everybody has family. Not, not everybody's fortunate to get out and have that family support. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate to have family support. I mean, it wasn't there. Years past, but you know, like they rebuild, it takes time, and, and you know, that's one of the main things is 
trying to welcome someone to the community, that especially if they don't have that, to be able to have a community support that they can call or think of family that will support them. So just trying to find whatever, I mean, you think is going to work for you and just good some good people. Obviously, I mean, if you're an alcoholic, you're not going to sit in a bar all night. So you got to, you just got to find what, what, what works for you. And you got to, you know you're triggered. You know yourself better than anybody. So I think uh, having a second chance. I agree with that. We don't want a handout. That's the thing is we just want to hand up and be able to have the same shot as anybody else does. I would say that the same. Uh, it's about having a support structure, having, having people around you that are supporting, um, whether it's family or community. Uh, but you have to have a support structure that's going to hold you accountable. You know, somebody, it doesn't have to be explicit. Certainly not like the Department of Corrections supervision sort of account. That's, that's, that's helpful in a, in a sense, but that's not really the long-term answer. Just having people around you that have even an unspoken expectation of you, or that, that create expectations in yourself. You, know, you say, I don't want to let these people down. Um, to where you hold yourself accountable to a higher standard, that, that keeps you out of trouble. It keeps me out. I want to let my little girl in. I'll tag on to that too. Exactly that. You know, it. It. I spent nine months in the home, and that's where I made the decision to change what I'm, I did in my life. And I sat in there doing endless push-ups and reading books and no TV, no radio for nine months in a little concrete box, saying, "What do I have to do to never ever come back here? Because this really sucks." Um, and I realized that I had to change everything in my life. People I hung out with, the places I went, uh, the things that I did, the thing you know, I had to get an edu I had to renew my education because I had gone to college before. I went to school for mechanical engineering, but I was better at shooting dope than designing stuff. And I came when I came out, and I and I was helped by an organization to get into school, and I saw this need for us to help you. You know, nobody was ever to really help me, and I saw a way to. Like, hey, if there had been somebody there who could help me do this, this, and this, and just not even do it for me, but just guide me down that path, like point out, hey, did you remember to do this? Or, hey, don't forget about this. Hey, this scholarship application is coming up. So I started helping people out, and exact, exactly what you were saying, Derek, I, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, I found that uh, by doing those things and helping other people, I was developing something I never had in my life before, which was integrity. And my definition of integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. When I know that I'm working with people, that I'm saying, hey, this is the way I did it, and this is what's enabled me to be successful, in my world, there's not a whole lot of gray. There's all, it's pretty much you're either doing the right thing or you're not. You know, even one wrong thing can lead to all of the wrong things. And if I'm going to lead by example or give somebody a hand and point down the path, I'm not much of a guide if I'm doing the wrong things myself. So therefore, I have to, I'm being held accountable by every single person I help. And the more people I help, the more people I'm held accountable by without even them actually holding me accountable. And therefore, I'm continuing down the right path. And, it's, and it, it guides me down that path, too. So I, I really agree. You know, every single day, I meet with people that I've worked with or that I go to class with, whether they're re-entry or not. And, you know, People, most people who know me, they're like, hey, how are you doing? How, how's your day going? I'm always, I'm awesome. <laughs> I could lock my own door behind me. I could go to the store without getting in trouble. Oh my God, I could, I could buy whatever I wanted at the store. I actually have money in the bank account. I don't have to bury it in my backyard anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and as people, like, I, I look forward every day. I see Marvin almost every day. I see Derek every single day. I see Sam every single day. My roommate's standing over there. He's a re-entry student. I see Rob every single day, and all of these people, I guarantee at least half, if not every single one of them, if I started doing the wrong thing, going back to what I used to be doing, guaranteed myself would be on the front porch in the morning. Or actually, as soon as I got home at night, because, yeah, my mom is not going to tolerate it. Um, and every single one of these people are going to look me right in the eye, and I'm not going to be able to lie to them. So I find people that I'm able to allow to, uh, and then that's the basic thing, is to allow them to hold me accountable. I never, I didn't care what anybody thought people <clears throat> There's also another aspect of accountability uh, in wanting to be successful for the people who, who are unable to do that. You know, I, 
I've met so many people in prison who have life sentences that can, that'll never have this opportunity. You know, and uh, I don't want to let them down, even if they never know. You know, um, the the victim in my crime, even though it was never in my heart or intention for anybody to get hurt, I was just trying to get a But um, my negligence caused somebody to lose their life. Um, my recklessness, not caring enough to understand the situation I was involved in, resulted in a loss of human life. And there's a void in the continuum now that needs to be built. And I have to do my part to try and make it better. So that'll hold you accountable. I'm just curious, do you know the gender ratio percentage of formerly incarcerated students at Central? Is it 100%? It's, it's not something that she is self identification, so it's not something that's, that I'm aware of that's asked, like, are you this or that? No, I mean, is it 100% male? No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. 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 no it's okay. We're, this is what this is about. This is about educating the, the public. And, you know, and let's, you know, you're talking about support. Your guys' support is huge. Because today, I'm still struggling with allowing my past to find me who I am. And I know it best. Who I am today is who I am. Um, so, again, it's about educating. About the question here. Yeah. question is, without this program, uh, where do you pay? I mean, if the program wasn't around, do you guys feel that um, you would go back into that? Past that you were in? No, I don't. I mean, personally, <clears throat> I believe that by no means DOC had anything to do with this except for probably upset me. But <laughs> just being, being locked up, it's really a personal choice because I know Derek for a while, but when we're in school, we're taking classes, prison is severely aversive to any type of education from the staff to the other people that are incarcerated with you. And I would regularly hear people say, why are you going to go, why are you going to go math class? You need to come play basketball and work out. You ain't going to go to school when you get out. Or what you going to, or the officer would be like, I don't know why you're wasting your time. You're just going to get out there and sell dope again. I'm like, actually, I did sell dope. Thank you very much. <laughs> so just the whole environment and the way that DOC is set up, they're not, it's not set up to help you rehabilitate. It's there as a form of punishment. So just for anyone that doesn't know, it's not there to be like, oh, you're going to go to jail and get better. Actually, you go to jail, and if anything, they prepare you to be worse when you get out. And this is a self-change that you have to make unless you take it upon yourself. To That's what self-change is. <laughs> I'm just saying you're not listening to me. Sorry. <laughs> 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 But uh, I mean, just the guys that are here, and just knowing that the, with the work you got to do, with the things you got to deal with, and the struggles, I truly believe we all would have been here. It probably would have been a lot harder. I mean, he probably had the worst. I think he he, he he's like the one that paved the way that made it easier for myself and these other gentlemen to get in. But I think that it's a personal change that we made within ourselves to say, hey, either we don't like the situation. I don't really like people telling you what to do. Tell me when I can take a shower or when I can eat and get mad if I want to uh, watch TV late at night and they're not okay with it. And two, other people might be like, well, I'm tired of disappointing my friends or family and I want to be able to say, hey, I'm better than this. And my main inspiration is that I know that there's young people out there that are living a reckless life. And that I hope that if they can see me and say, yo, there was Mark right there. You know what, man, Mark's going to school. He's, he's doing math. I tell young people all the time, they're like, I hate math. And I say, you hate math? You like money? <laughs> so hold on, you, you, like, you, you like money, but you don't like math, but math helps you count your money. They say, yeah, well, you might want to reevaluate that. Man. <laughs> so just thinking of things like that and being able to inspire young people and hopefully to transform my community to prevent so much young black men from being incarcerated and severely unfair rates with a lack of equality or equity in the game and give them that positive role model to hopefully do my small part to uplift the whole community and get people away from the 
the TV version of black people, which is completely inaccurate. They was watching music videos and say, oh, all black people are like that. Absolutely. Actually, most of them are. Mm -hmm. Most of them got jobs that work hard, but are struggling just like everyone else. But there's constantly being perpetuated by the things that you see on the news that leads people to believe that people of color, not only black people, are something that's not even remotely close to how the community is. That's a really important point that I wanted to touch on, Martin, has made there, um, that oppositional social identity. Um, when a young black man, woman, a young minority um, comes into adolescence and they start realizing they're minority. I mean, you don't see little kids really so much concerned with who's black, white, or any other color. You know, they're, they're kids. But when you reach adolescence, the world starts looking at you differently. And you start looking at yourself differently and trying to understand what does that mean to be a young black man? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to act like? And children look to popular media. They start to develop this oppositional social identity. Um, there's a great book by Beverly Tatum that I would recommend you all read. It's uh, called um, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, <laughs> chapter 4 talks about adolescent um, social identity. But um, I think that's a cardinal contributing factor um, to why so many young black men have been present. Uh, it's unfortunate. But yeah, um, creating uh, or presenting a, a pro-social model for what a black man is, is uh, that's, that's of cardinal importance to uplifting the whole community. That's a great point and a very noble pursuit. Question? Um, question? Question? Um, I'm a Seattle Central teacher who teaches at King County, King County Detention Center. And so I'm curious, um, if you were writing a textbook, what would your chapters be? So what would be beneficial to teach? I mean, aside from reading, writing, and math. I mean, I heard housing, um, paperwork for housing, paperwork for college applications. What else? Humanities. <laughs> Humanities. <laughs> Humanities. Humanities, sociology, and psychology. Humanities, because um, it gives you an opportunity to rethink that identity, and and I think that's where everything starts at. You know, our choices really get filtered through uh, our self perception at the time. And if you want to truly tap into that transformative power of education, I think it lies there. Technology also. <clears throat> Big cure over here, the OG in the building. I think the technology will be good. And personally, I think that media literacy will be very, very important because it took me a while before I became media literate and being able to see something on TV or watch a certain news program and not take for face value and be able to evaluate that compared to other news programs and be able to extrapolate what's really going on and not just fall into the, the political games, is what I would call it. Because I think that, you know, politics and that is pretty much like a game. Because I noticed people, let me see what it is. I think I said like a Dave Chappelle. He's like, he's in the middle of America. And he was talking to some white lady. And he's like, she was like, oh, yeah, I voted for Trump. He's like, you know, Trump is for me and not you. Because I'm rich and you're not. <laughs> 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 he got my back. You know what I'm But people are so caught up in you know, their political identity and not being able to extrapolate what's really important to them as a person. And they're like, oh, it's blue, it's red, oh, I'm a Republican, oh, I'm a Democrat, and it's not even well. But what are they really doing for you? And I think that media literacy will be able to help, you know, the generation coming up, and my generation, the future generations to say, hey, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, I care about what you're doing for myself, for me and my family and the people that I care about to be able to help the country and not lie in your pockets. Can I add to that? Right I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as writing, I mean, really at the beginning, if you got the table of content, I mean, an empowerment piece. I mean, a lot of, lot of shame, uh, self-shame. It's really one of, the, one of the big barriers is just 
ourselves. We, we, we trooper sabotage ourselves, we trip ourselves all up. We live in that shame. And just understanding that that's the past and how to move forward. And that kind of thing, and, and just and, and having that self and, and you know, giving yourself some dignity within you are a human being, you're breathing and you're doing the right thing right now. What you're doing is right. That kind of thing. That that would probably be helpful as well. And goal uh, setting. Uh, oh. Goal setting. I know. <laughs> and, and anger management. <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, my, my teacher, Mr. Silverman, Silverman, who was on the same page, um, maybe a lot of my classmates don't know why I'm so motivated in classes because um, this is my first uh, quarter in uh, college. And um, I, too, I'm a woman, and I've been in prison before, too. I've been 27 months in prison. So my classmates don't understand why I'm so excited to learn. And um, to know you guys are on this campus, you know, I was embarrassed of that part, but it's good to know that I have somebody else here that's been down the same path. I too just got out of work release. I too just got out of RJC too, so, but I did my time in California. So um, I'm presently in drug court too, at this present moment, and um, I've been six months um, clean and sober. <laughs> To you is um, do you have do you guys support us women too in going to college? Absolutely. Because <laughs> <laughs> I see them the men up there, that's why. But I just wanted to share that um, I felt uncomfortable to my first time making an attempt at life, and uh, I have the same background as you guys, and uh, I get it. You know, homelessness can be a problem if you're trying to go to school and you want to better yourself and stuff like that. So I'm going to try and get with you guys. And, uh, administration staff or faculty okay so I want to make you guys all aware of one thing and this is another chapter for your book being proactive <laughs> my first quarter here and we're talking about barriers and things like that there's lots of barriers one of the biggest ones that we face is those of us are coming out probation I want to let you guys all know that when it comes and I ran into this personally my first quarter math class finals got to finals at 9 a.m. I get a call from my CCO that says, yeah, be in my office at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. If you're not, I will violate you and send you back. I had to go to my teacher and be like, and tell him, hey, look, I got this choice. I can either take my final or I can go back to prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would any of you do? You know, guess I'm getting a lower grade. Um, luckily, that teacher, I didn't, be unbeknownst to me before that, he's like, yeah, I hate probation. I've had to deal with them being in the past. He's like, no problem. <laughs> I, I'm giving it. He's like, I'm giving another. I'm giving another final to another class. I know. He's like, I know the type of student you are, and you're not going to go talk to people and find out what the test is. Why don't you come in at 6 p.m.? I was like, wow, that was awesome, and I was able to go take my final at a different time because that teacher was understanding. But there's so many things like that. We can be called, literally five minutes notice. Yeah, you need to be down in my office right now. We don't have any choice in that. Meet me at your house right now. I want to do a home visit. We don't have a choice in that matter. We have to sometimes just say, I got to miss class. I got to miss a test. I can't, I can't be there because I have these other obligations. And to, to have, if you can have the understanding that these are things beyond our control and can share with your coworkers and other faculty especially, that these are things that we have no control over. You know, that would be an awesome first step towards understanding that is one of the major barriers that I personally have encountered. So. I just, I want to thank you for saying that. I've worked with multiple students, many students that have um, criminal backgrounds, and this kind of thing does come up all the time. And I think a lot of people are aware of some of those additional barriers like you're talking about, you know, the housing, the employment, that kind of thing, I think we all know. But I think <coughs> things like paying your clients restitution, and people don't know about those barriers that you're facing that aren't as obvious. 
you know, and I wonder if you would talk a little bit about some of those, too, um, that can really affect your life. <coughs> Oh, $50,000 at 12% interest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and they charge you that interest, one interest, and then have zero ability to pay it. So if you're in there for 20 years, you got 20 years of interest, you come out with a $50, if you, for example, I went in owing $1,800, I came out owing $9,000. Uh -huh. And I had no way to pay it. I made 32 cents an hour in prison, and I had to buy hiking stuff. And is this an institution? Yeah. So, yeah. so a lot of people the cost, I don't know. The crime victim's compensation fund paid for uh, part of uh, the victim's funeral expenses. Um, the judge ordered, I think it was six thousand dollars in restitution, joint and several, with me and my co-defendants, uh, because I was the first to get out and. The two that were involved in the homicide won't be getting out for, any, for a long time. Um, I'll be paying that entire amount because it was joint in several. They make 32 cents an hour, they won't be able to pay. During the time, the seven years I was in prison, the restitution racks up at 12%. So now it's at $11,000. So that's relatively small restitution compared to some of the people I've met in prison. Um, but if you look at it the same way, um, do the math, it can be huge. And, um, yeah. But the thing that ties to that is, is if you're, depending on who your CCO, this one the thing about the CCOs, the people that supervise your community, they're all different. You can have one that, he can have a CCO that allows him to be able to function and actually make it throughout the day. There's others that are just so much more uh, strict, if you will. Um, they can look at your payment history on, on your LFOs, and if they decide that you're, you've been delinquent, they can violate you. So one day, you're like, well, you missed, your, you missed your payment a couple months, you can be violated. That violation can result in jail time. For us to go to jail for three days, really damage everyone we go. So I mean, it, it just it, one leads to another, but everything always falls back onto that violation. You don't pay your LFOs, it's a violation. You don't follow your community code, it's a violation. So a lot of us got those barriers and we're tied to care of. Mm -hmm. Us balancing that, coming to school, mm -hmm. keeping our mind right, getting support. I mean, to try and educate mm -hmm. you guys that we're you know, really not bad people today. Don't be scared. Don't be, I mean, I was in one class when I brought it up, and she, when she realized that I was from, from prison, and she was an international student, but, but, but she, she doesn't know, and you don't know what you don't know, and she's like, so she really didn't want to be in any groups with me anymore, because I was from prison. I mean, so it's just, those little things, you know, so I really stress, I can't stress enough that your support is huge. So I went back to that again. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. The one thing about LFOs too, I'm, I'm part of, uh, Project called the uh, Living Living with Conviction, done by Debbie Espinosa, and she was talking about the the effects of LFOs and legal financial obligations on people who are formerly incarcerated. I asked her, you know, about the interest rates and everything. Well, there's two things that are really weird about, or horrible about it. I said, it, well, you know, this church has a high interest rate, isn't that considered usury? She did some research and found out that they charge one tenth of one percent below what would be considered illegal. And unlike other loans or, or other debts that people may have, as the interest accrues and you make payments on it, they give you a minimum payment. If you make over and above, if you make above the minimum payment, it doesn't come off of the principal. It just strictly comes off the interest. I have, a, I have a friend who was charged with stealing a vehicle. He didn't steal the vehicle, he was in a stolen vehicle. The person who <coughs> stole the vehicle admitted to stealing the vehicle. They both got charged for the full value of the vehicle, even though the vehicle was returned to the person with zero damage to the vehicle. He went to prison, he got out. By making his minimum payments, he will never, ever touch the principal or get out from under that debt. And will remain under the supervision of the court for the rest of his life. But it's, yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, they, they may, and, and the way the courts do, we don't have a debtor's prison in America, but their way around that, their loophole is, if you, King County doesn't do this. Well, they, they, they do to some people at some times, but the biggest one is in Homish County, but if you don't pay your legal financial obligations, at least the minimum payment, they 
instead of saying you're going to jail for not paying your debt, they say you're in contempt of court. And then they come and arrest you. And then you sit in there and even and can't pay it even longer. So the point is we just it's if you're in jail, right. you're not keeping your job. Mm -hmm. So you get out and have to start all over again. Right. Uh, yeah. So there is a there is a big hit the lottery. There is a big offer <laughs> The, yeah, the, the vote the vote got defeated the last year and the year before. Yeah. But they're trying to get so at least just the interest can be stricken. Yes. And I I've, I've told the court to myself, look, if you'll take off the interest, I'll pay the entire debt. I owe this money and I and I'm willing to pay, but I'm not paying if I can't ever pay it off. Yeah. Yeah, come get me. <laughs> 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 Because what I'm hearing right now is that not only, you know, is there the stigma associated with having been convicted of a crime and that just, just doesn't go away, then there's also the fees that don't go away. And so how does that make you feel like more, like, uh, within, like your self-esteem? Because I can't imagine like me trying to repair everything in my life and then there's still that constant reminder oh, and, yeah. and that's not acceptable. I so, honestly wonder if it's, if it's um, ever going to make a difference, you know, like it's just hard work every morning to get me out of some hole there. What do they yeah. say? Well, not, <laughs> not just necessarily the DLC, but I mean, to think about it in a broader context, like <coughs> there are fields <coughs> that a felony conviction mm -hmm. becomes essentially an absolute barrier to entry. Uh, I mean, there's felon lawyers, but trust me, not many, and they fought tooth and nail to get there. Uh, you can go and get a law degree, you can pass the bar exam, but it's up to the bar association whether or not they want to admit you. Um, you're almost completely barred from entering the health any health profession. Um, I don't know about real estate, but let's say you just got an engineering degree, um, then you have to worry about who's going to hire you and how they're going to look at your conviction. So uh, that stigma really does limit um, your vision about what's possible. You know, you have to start thinking about that facet of it. Okay, how is this going to affect my opportunities? So that's a tough one, I think. So it's like one of the biggest poverty trends, right? Well, in order to room for advancement, a lot, a lot of ways. I mean, you got to get strategic, right? In order to really get behind and do something, you have to believe it's possible. In order to to get to a destination, you have to believe that that destination is there, right? And um, that barrier can sometimes, whether it's a, a real, there are real barriers, but the perceived yeah. barrier sometimes is a bigger hurdle to overcome. I mean, even I'm going to school for business. I want to help other formerly incarcerated people and women and minorities start their own businesses. Um, and uh, I, I chose that over engineering because I thought that would be a more reasonable field to go into considering that I'm a film. Mm -hmm. uh, also because it's something I want to do, but I think I might have enjoyed the engineering field better or I might have enjoyed being a doctor better. Mm -hmm. um, so that perceived barrier, I think, what became my actual barrier. I think it's better not to think about it. Personally, I just say to myself, like, whatever, if you don't like it, I'll be all right. Hey, you'll get over it. And then, not only that, I think that uh, somebody told me something one time, and it stuck with me, I think about it all the time, when they wanted to do something, someone was questioning, was like, don't want to do that before. He was like, be the first. So that's, that's, my, that's my thought process. No one got it, try to be the first. So that's, where I go at, and I, that's where I try to push it at, to say, hey, sure no one's ever did that before, but you ain't never met Marvin before. <laughs> so, I, take a, I take a different tack than these guys. Mm -hmm. it's, it's similar, but I'll tell you straight up, right off, the, right off the bat, yeah, you know what, I'm a convict. I did five years in prison. As soon as I tell you that, you can never hold that against me that I never told you. And if there's a problem with that, I want to know from the gate. And the company, you know, luckily I'm getting in the IT field, and everybody I've talked to, and this is a big company like Amazon or Microsoft, they're like, yeah, 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 cool, cool, cool. Yeah, you're in school and, and you're doing good. I don't care about your past, can you code? 
there's the, the other aspect of risk tolerance. Um, once you go to prison and you've lost time, I mean, I've lost seven years that, I, that seven years of working on a career, seven years of building uh, a professional network, seven years of, of work history, uh, seven years of developing uh, documented human capital, right? Um, so your tolerance for risk goes down. Um, you think I can't fail that plus the other exigencies of being under DOC supervision and, and the financial aspects. Your tolerance for risk goes down, so you can't take as many um, leaps of faith as you would. I have to tell myself every day, this college education is going to pay off because otherwise I could just go and get a job in construction. I see all these these tower cranes up and I and I have skills in construction. I can get a decent paying job right now. And it's a sacrifice to finish my degree and go to school. And I have to tell myself every day, that's the biggest thing I fight with, I think, other than like, I mean even more than demands on attention or the emotional um, uh, challenges of re-entry. Uh, just telling myself every day that this is going to matter. This is going to The ripple effect of groups like this, too, meeting with you, every single one of you, uh, hopefully, will come out with a different per perception of who we are as people and as students and as your neighbor, as the guy walking next to you on the street, the guy sitting next to you on the bus, the person, you know, you don't even know it. Hopefully that ripple effect you can let other people know and other people know. I mean, my whole path through here started by Julia Bouchons. She took, I, so we gave her a hey, you should hire and I'm like, oh cool, I want to work and I'll get a job and she hired me. She, I told her straight out in the interview, hey, I just did five years in prison. I just got out like two months ago. She's like, okay, cool. Well, when, when can you start? <laughs> and she took a chance now, I think mean, half of her staff in there, almost half her staff are formerly incarcerated students. And we show up every day. We do our job to the best of our abilities. We cover shifts for people when they're sick. We're no different than anybody else. And she's enabled this program to get started from where I started, and then where Nick took over, and, and to, to where it is today, and enabled me uh, by working in that office. Hey, I need to help a guy take care of this. Who would I talk to? Oh, go talk to Liz Yalu over at registration. And by doing that, I got to meet people in all the different departments and let them know what was going on. And now any of us can go into any of those departments and all we have to do is say we're re-entry and they, they do whatever they, they need to to help us because they understand because we've been working with them for a couple of years now. So hopefully, as I said, the ripple effect from this, of this conversation will go out and continue and perpetuate. I think we're, uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out.